Welcome back to the Apollo Road Podcast. Joined with Eric Meek today. Welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Of course. Um, to start off, we met officially what, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Um, you can basically take this as an example of business that happened purely over Instagram. Just, I don't know how I found you on Instagram, but um, followed you. He does nice work. I just happened to be in a spot where, oh, I needed some laser work done. You know, reached out. You got back to me right away. Got the job done. I was like, all right, cool. I, I like working with Eric. He's just prompt, upfront, and uh, all that because of Instagram. You know, I think today we usually kind of shit on social media and uh it's easy to see the negatives of it but absolutely every now and then it's like hey you make make a new friend make new contact you just so that's, no, i appreciate that's it. the intro for today yeah but um yeah thanks for doing the podcast and it's not a lot of people would jump right in and you know from uh the initial acquaintance to hey let's do some you know let's do some media or something yeah i was a, a little nervous about it but uh I, I think it'll be cool, so let's give it a run. Yeah, right on. So uh, laser cutting is not your primary avocation. Um, you're a, a longtime APD uh, employee and and uh, service member. Um, how's that been here in Albuquerque? Uh, you know, it's it's every day is, is something different, that's for sure. Um, I started back in 2003 moved here from St. Louis, Missouri, uh, about a week before the academy started, actually, Okay. and jumped right into it. And here I am today, uh, almost 18 years later, and I still love the job. I do, but uh, the climate has changed so much that um, it, it's time to Time to shut it down. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the phrase hold the line is, uh, I, I think that you could speak far more to what that means to you. And, um, you know, you, that's a rough, it's a rough way to make a living and to constantly be putting yourself ahead of everybody else. So I would say, uh, you know, hats off to you for sticking that, that job out for so long. Yeah, thank you. Um, I know it's, you know, most people can't imagine how, like you said, how different it is and how tough it is. But, um, yeah, so a career in the police force. And had you always wanted to go into uh, police work? or? No, what's funny is, is um, <clears throat> in college I, I was a computer science okay. major. I had a, uh, a uh, scholarship to Bradley University. Um, went to Bradley for about a year and learned very quickly that if you don't go to school in class like you should, they tend to frown upon that. So um, I ended up leaving Bradley and started the electrician's apprenticeship for okay. local 34 union electricians back home. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, Graduated a five-year apprenticeship, worked for another three years, moved to St. Louis. Mm -hmm. Work started getting slow, and uh, I kind of got a wild hair, mm -hmm. and I thought, let's let's try police work. Hmm. Yeah, and, that's... And I loved it. I mean, fell into it, and, and here I am, so... No, oh, that's cool. No, that's cool. It's... it's uh, every time I do this podcast and I talk to people, it's always an interesting... Uh, Path. Everybody has sort of the zigzag path, right? And there's yeah. always an interesting kind of in, or they just, people, you know, always they say, yeah, I fell into it and it just happened to work and for a long time. And that's, uh, that's great to hear. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I, I was home uh, back in Peoria for a weekend and I ran into a childhood friend that works for APD and she says, Hey, they're hiring. And, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, <laughs> okay, well, that doesn't mean anything to me, but, and I kind of, you know, I, I kind of marinated on that for a bit and it, I finally called her and said, Hey, I'm going to come down and check it out. Hmm. So came down to visit, met some really cool people down here and 
next thing I knew, I was putting in my application, and uh, it was, you know, it's about a three month process. Is it the standard academy? It's it is right. It's like twelve. Is it a twelve week uh, process? So ours is. Uh, it was twenty six weeks. Twenty six. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And is that all? Sp- at once, or do they kind of chunk it out into uh, semesters? Or no. So when when I first started, it was um, we started at around six thirty in the morning, mm-hmm. Monday through Friday, and we were there until four thirty, five thirty, sometimes six thirty. Yeah. Um, in the evening, and it was a combination of uh, physical training. Right academics, um, a lot of disciplinary stuff, firearms training, mm-hmm. um, defensive tactics, things like that. That's a lot. It, it that was. is a lot for, uh, it's, you know, school's hard enough. I mean, I was always, I always struggled with school and sitting, sitting still for a couple hours at a time, but yeah. I can only imagine when there's so many physical and just the sheer, the pressure of, you know, what you have to study is like, we got to get this right. And, you know, that's gotta be <laughs> long days. <laughs> Well, it, it was funny too, Alex, because when I moved here, I knew one person. That was it. Mm. Um, and I literally knew how to get from my house to the academy. Mm. So that was my my day. Mm-hmm. Um, and there would be some mornings I'd wake up at about five and lay in bed and think, "What am I doing? Like this is, you know." Um, but. At the end, it was it was one of the best decisions I made. So, oh, that's good. Yeah, it was cool. Yeah, that uh, that moment where you're like, oh, what what have I gotten myself into? But hey, the fact is, you you stuck it out clearly and had a you know successful career. Yeah, and, um, yeah, it's been great. And yeah, and you know, it's I think that is a. I mean, you could speak more to this, but just the the uh, skill and the just the trait of service consistency you know there's i i like the term civilian um these days just because it it's people don't really talk that way anymore of of being having your you know duty as a citizen your duty is you know somebody on the front line whether that's police healthcare, military anything it's a distinction but it it doesn't mean that you don't have any less duty. You know, that it's still important to be a good citizen, important to be whatever occupation you find yourself in. I think ultimately it's like, if you can do, do the best you can and know that you're helping other people, like that's sort of what I think is lost a little bit these days. And absolutely. So it's just great to like, you know, meet somebody that really upholds that and has lived it. And, uh, and you know, now that you're transitioning, I guess, into more, uh, more furniture and, and uh, design, um, that must be a nice breath of fresh air. Yeah, well, <clears throat> what's funny is, too, is um, about five or six years ago, I had actually started um, doing remodels. So um, I've, I fell in love with that there for a while. Um, my father-in-law, he lives in Indiana, He's a general contractor, Mm -hmm. and uh, he was a furniture maker prior to. So he was the one who kind of got me kind of planted that bug. Mm -hmm. And so I I really kind of got a little bit of passion for it, but I had opportunities to do remodels, um, you know, small remodels in, in homes. So I went with that, and it took off, and... I worked a lot of hours, mm-hmm. and so it was tough having my my work schedule plus doing remodels. You know, it was it was uh, my wife had the patience of a saint there for a couple of years because you know it was literally working uh, after hours through the week, working weekends sometimes. Um, so then a short while after maybe eh, about three or four years, I kind of went back into doing the furniture making, the industrial furniture, because I love the metal and wood. Mm. Um, didn't really jump into it too heavy, but uh, then COVID came around, and it kind of gave me an opportunity to really run with it. Just, you know, 
having a lot of time at home. Mm -hmm. And it, it worked out great because I wasn't going on the weekends. I wasn't going after hours. I was, you know, just out, out on the property in the shop right. um, um, working, so... And so uh, you've got a nice setup in basically like in your in your garage and your garage opens two bays so it feels like you can you can spread out and you can uh, get some bigger pieces of, right. of furniture or steel or raw materials in there right which is nice and just having it you know kind of in your in your backyard is saves you the time and the commute and it does um, so when you did you start black hammer designs before covid or was it during covid that you sort of started to brand it and figure out, all right, this is, you know, I've got something here. During COVID, um, and it, it it was kind of a, uh, I won't say a knee-jerk decision, but it was something where I just, it hit, <clears throat> excuse me, it hit me. Mm -hmm. Like the, the passion for it just, it was so relaxing, um, you know, for, for me to go out and create mm -hmm. and uh then i would find myself almost 24 7 there was something going on in my brain about i should try this or mm -hmm. hey i can you know this would be really cool um a, a, a cool little creation um like i said it was mainly furniture and then once it hit me um i just happened that somebody called me about doing a cutting board and I said, yeah, I mean, I can, I can do a cutting board. And the next thing I knew, I had about 50 orders for cutting boards. And that was when I said, you know what? Black Hammer Designs, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to kick it off. There you go. Yeah. So, man, that's, um, that's always, that, that is always nice when you get a stack of orders and you're like, okay. <laughs> it's funny because that's sort of what happened to me in college um, I designed a titanium spatula. So we had a, we had an aluminum cooking spatula that, you know, you use in the, in our dorm and in our apartment and stuff. And right. one day it just snap, you know, it's like, eh. and I'd always liked, uh, exotic materials and motorcycles and cars. And yeah. it was sort of, so I was like, man, I wonder, I wonder how hard it would be to make something out of titanium. Cause I was just, like you said, it's, you just get that bug in your head and you're like, yeah. man, what can I, can Absolutely. I work with this? And Long story short, I ended up making a few prototypes and I kind of like convinced the water jet to just, Hey, I just have this one little piece of material. Can you just knock it out for just me. knock it yeah. out? You know, it's <laughs> kind of like, and I, don't know, I was like a college kid. So they're like, yeah, sure. And they charged me like, you know, just not a full, no, no minimum or anything. Right. So I got the first ones made and, and sure enough, you know, I was like, Oh, then I got a stack of orders and I'm like, all right, knee jerk. Here and I go. just, and I went you know, full tilt. I was like, I got an LLC and I started the whole process. And I think I started a couple of years too soon, but it was a, a learning experience and here we are. <laughs> yeah. I, I can relate to that for sure. I, I kind of did the same thing, jumped in, um, kind of had the cart before the horse, mm -hmm. you know, LLC, um, logos, mm -hmm. but it's slowly kind of all balancing out now and I'm getting yeah. caught up. So good. When did you jump into laser work? Because you bought like uh, a kit, and those kits are are not easy. It's not like you just open that thing up and push go. I mean, right. there's there's a lot of setup. There's building the thing. There's making sure it's square. Then there's the whole software side and learning. How did you jump into that? Well, <laughs> again, it was uh, putting the cart before the horse. You know, I bought my first uh, or tour. Um, laser and it, it wasn't very expensive but and it was you know one of the smallest ones they made and I told myself you have no idea uh, no idea really what you're doing so I didn't want to go in debt a whole bunch of money so started out small and um, I taught myself the software uh, light burn pretty easy to use but it was Every project I did was, I learned something that I made a mistake on or whatever. So, um, so it, it was kind of trial by error with mm. it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, then I really got comfortable with it, uh, and then I bought a, a little bit bigger one. So now I run two, 
and it's it's kind of the same thing with the with the the wood CNC. Um, I bought that Bob's CNC machine, mm -hmm. had to put it together. Uh, my daughter, she and I sat, and I think it took us about six hours to put it all together. She would yeah. she would take all the screws and dip them in Loctite for oh, me, yeah. prep them for me, you know. Nice. And uh, yeah, we got it together, and same thing. I had no clue what I was doing. Um, taught myself the software and no, that's cool. That's um, yeah, that rings some bells for me too because we have the Shop Saber uh, CNC, and it was kind of the same thing where got it set up. You know, we called tech support just to get the hey, how do we get the initial setup, and they walk you through it. But from there, it was like, oh, oh shit, like <laughs> you know, it's real now. It's real. Yeah, um, yeah, it's funny and as. How long have I been I'm trying to think? A couple of years, maybe five years, um, just running CNC equipment. I always thought that I was doing something wrong. I was like, man, I feel like I should know how this works. And then you talk to everybody, and even like the people that run it day in and day out, they're like, yeah, you know, like I, I messed this thing up the other day. And yeah, it's just you're always, you're always on that line of, you know, something's easy and then you mess it up and then you have to relearn and then oh it's, yeah so i'm starting to realize oh, i think that's just how it is you just jump in make a bunch of mistakes absolutely um like i said even and i think for me was i got comfortable maybe a little cocky thinking oh this you know i know what i'm doing this is yeah. easy and you're and you'll get them uh you know a piece set up and totally forget something, you know, something small, but then next thing you know, your router's cutting out on the wrong side, you know, the wrong end yep. of, the, of the piece, and yep. which isn't that bad on some of the less expensive wood, mm -hmm. but you know, you get some of your expensive like olive wood or something in there, um, you hate to screw that up. Yeah. So, been there. Yep, yep, been there, and it's see what I like about your setup is that. You built the you built the box around it with the plexi. Yeah, enclosure um, was a ours, game changer. Yeah, ours doesn't have that. And, yeah, you know, like I, I got glasses, but I know that if that carbide snaps, I mean, you're basically it's a missile. You're getting hit. Yeah. Um, so I'm always like, you know, I'm always sweating when yeah. I'm operating that thing, even in the winter. Oh so yeah. I'm just like, all right, I gotta make sure. But you know, once you get in the groove, I mean, I think it sounds like you've got some bread and butter with just like smaller wood items that it's like you know what just you just run it you run it and you get comfortable with it and you know where your mistakes can happen absolutely um so what's it like you know having the orders keeping things going or, and are you still looking ahead like oh can i get a you're looking at a bigger anything bigger are you looking at upscaling a little bit or so you know being Right now, I'm about six months from retirement, so I'm comfortable with where I'm at um, because it's still kind of part part time. Um, but yes, once I retire, it would be great to get a bigger CNC, um, get a bigger laser, to, just to be able to do some bigger pieces, and uh, you know, time wise, to shave down yeah. some of the work time. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, cool. And it, it I kind of connect to the dots. Like you said you kind of went into computer science and in school, and it it sounds like you you already had an inkling for how how that stuff worked. I mean, that stuff's like the kit stuff isn't really intimidating to me. I've never really been able to um, get my head just into like wiring and electronics, and so that, that stuff I've always sort of just like been really hesitant to do. But it sounds like you kind of already had like a knack for it, or maybe it's it's something that doesn't uh, it doesn't intimidate you too much. Well, <laughs> I think you know it's, it, it's been a combination of things: the the computer background for the computer science. Um, ever since I was a kid, I liked working and tinkering on mm -hmm. things. Uh, it was always very mechanical, and then becoming an, an electrician. Um, that was where. To this day, it's amazing because as when I was little, I could hardly, my dad would ask me to go get a tool and I'd have no clue 
absolutely no clue the most basic tool um so it's just kind of funny that i ended up you know working with tools on the regular but um but yeah the you know the building the constructing of, of the lasers building the the cnc was i actually really loved it you know i mean six hours was a long time but it was almost therapeutic mm-hmm. um yeah hmm. yeah that's um <clears throat> that stuff can't I, I had suspected that stuff can't really be taught i think the if you if you get if you're able to get lost in it in the work it's just that's sort of who ends up doing that kind of stuff yeah. right uh um yeah so what um what's it like combining you know the creative side with you know you have these orders you have deadlines uh because i would say like you're obviously a you're a creative even though your whole uh your current and you know the last um part of your career was in the police force right which is very you know the creativity is not you don't have a lot of room for creativity it's sort of like things got to be done by the book right yeah um, Black and white. so how does it how does it go co- moving from that industry that line of work into it's like you're your own boss you get the orders out but you can do it however however you want you know um it's so my my creativity is it's kind of in a box somewhat in in some ways as far as um the way i see things so my wife is very artistic um she she her, her creative mind goes way further than mine so it's funny because she'll she will just kind of describe something to me like, Hey, we could do this, um, on certain projects. And what she's describing to me is totally different than what I'm seeing. Right. So we kind of laugh about that. Um, a lot of my creativity just comes from, you know, looking at other, uh, I follow a lot of other, uh, uh, wood shops on, on Instagram. Mm-hmm. So I see some of the things that they, construct and then i just kind of add my tweaks to it or look at it and say okay i like this little piece of it but i i I would do it on a a totally different scale right Mm -hmm. so um yeah i i never thought i was a creative person when i was younger so Mm -hmm. this this is really cool to be able to to not have to be that i won't say a robot when as far as law enforcement you know but in a way you are right it's it, it's been for 18 years it's it's this pattern that you have so like you said now I'm my own boss I can you know I, I can basically do whatever I whatever I feel like for the day which is it's very satisfying yeah for sure I can imagine um, and that's you know you, you've already kind of hit on all the nuances that uh, I find that when I talk to people in the creative, whatever creative field it is, it's whether it's, you know, just craft furniture or pure art, painting, whatnot. It's always like that sort of, it's easier to channel your creative side when you have some sort of boundary or limitation where it's not just, okay, I have all the money in the world. I have all the time in the world. What now? Right. It's yeah. daunt, too daunting. Yeah. There too, you go. Too many options. Yeah. Um, and I'd love to get your opinion on what you think of this, you know, the world that we live in now with everything is on the phone, on Instagram, online. Um, cause I, I have a hard time on Instagram because I, I actually, I don't really follow too intensely like all the other shops and uh, creators. Cause when, you know, my mind is, I have a hard time reining it in, right? So mm-hmm. I see something and I say, oh, that's a really cool idea. Let me, and I'll, before I know it, I'm, I've already like gone down a rabbit, a rabbit hole, hole and it's, yeah, it'll get you. so what do you, what do you think is a good balance? You know, Alex, it, it's hard to say because, um, you know, for, for a, a really long time, I wasn't really into the whole social media. I mean, I had it to kind of stay in communication with some people back home, you know, buddies I grew up with and, things like that. Once I started Black Hammer, it really, 
it, it grew exponentially as far as how often I was on it. Um, and I think some of it's good, some of it's bad, right? I'm on it be- a, a lot, which obviously that's not good, but when I'm on it, it's more for like the creativity side of it, right? Just seeing all the new things that are out there, um, tools, uh, I, tools are my downfall. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but also what I'm learning is the networking, mm-hmm. right? So the networking is huge. Um, so I, I find that uh, there's a lot of communication for amongst um, other wood shops, tool shops, things like that. Um, and I think for me, it's been amazing. It really has, uh, you know, just being able to get my work out there and the feedback that you get, um, you know, it, it's, you try not to be that person that wants to look and see how many likes you got for a post, but right. you know, it, it, there are times when I'll look, I'm like, okay, well, obviously that was a popular piece. Um, and then before you know it, you know, the website starts getting hits and, um, it, it's, it's in turn, you start getting more sales. So yeah. for me being a small shop, social media has been pretty, pretty damn good. Yeah. Um, no, I'm glad that that's, it, it's like worked for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, just thinking about it, my parents used to have a retail store mm-hmm. and, the way I've started looking at your Instagram, you know, your store for lack of a better term is that really is like almost like your retail store now. And you'll get, you get thousands of people that walk through there every year yep. and it doesn't matter. It's just the ones that make contact. Yeah. You can then shake their hand, know them by name. It's, um, and yeah, that's how we met. You know, yeah, it's funny. You it's like, yeah, you're, yeah it's like, look at the numbers it's but that's not it it's you'll you'll get the people through that that you want to work with absolutely Um, yeah and that gives me hope too that it's you can see it as a positive and i'm more talking to myself because i just i get jaded pretty (laughs) pretty easily but the other thing too is that you know you mentioned that there was this other uh supplier wood supplier down in corrales right and you saw him on instagram and it's like oh so it was like boom 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 we just made a new connection where i I probably wouldn't have heard of them um, otherwise, or it would have taken a long time. But just that connectivity, like you said, is uh, can be beneficial. Yeah, it, um, and and the funny thing is, is I literally passed that wood shop daily for I don't know how many years, you know. Um, and I I met a guy networking through Instagram, uh, Marco Valles, and he and I just kind of started talking and and it was kind of along the same lines. It was about the laser engraving because he had wanted me to, uh, um, do some engravings for his logo. Hmm. And so he and I had just kind of stayed in communication and then he brought up the, the, uh, wood shop up there and, or the, the mill. And I was like, wait, it's on Corrales road. Really? Cause I, I and come to find out it, passed it every day for mm. who knows how long that's funny because i this area of town we're kind of right in the middle middle of town just because of the freeway intersections i'm always amazed that every time i drive just around the neighborhood oh there's like a plastic place where you can get acrylic polycarbonate like i didn't know that was there right there's yeah like pottery kiln there's all these really like niche sort of specialty businesses that, that's crazy like how would i ever find this and unfortunately like a lot of them are sort of like old guard older owners that you know they're not on instagram not, and yeah. um see so it makes you wonder like how much how much commerce is going on that you don't know about um and then also it kind of re- makes you realize like, oh you can you can forge your own way and you know get your slice of business that supports your family and it just takes l- the proactive side yeah absolutely um so is that uh have you ever thought about getting a getting a, a shop space a here in the next mortar? yeah brick and mortar um you know um my mom and i had talked about it uh a couple years ago just strictly we were just talking right it was before i'd even really started making anything 
Um, but for whatever reason that, that, that conversation came up, you know, it's, it's tough because so with my career, um, I've been a, a detective for 15 years now. I've always been kind of, um, my work and my personality, uh, my exposure has always kind of been in the shadows, mm-hmm. right? I, um, I didn't like necessarily being in, in public, mm-hmm. uh, per se, unless I was working, mm-hmm. right? So when I went home, I was home. I was, it was peace and quiet, yeah. right? I'm with my family. Um, so this whole thing of um, marketing myself has been really, it, it was difficult in the beginning, right? Making the videos and things like that. So for right now, online and yeah. through social media, it's it's comfortable for me. Yeah, it's um, still a separation. I'd there you go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So hopefully once I retire, yeah. you know, it, it might get a little easier for me and you get the volume of sales to where it would be beneficial to. Yeah, that makes sense. It's, um, I only asked now because it's, it's sort of a weird time with people Crazy. moving to Albuquerque. Yeah. Um, which the, it seemed like Albuquerque always always lagged the general um, the general market and all of the growth was always in the bigger cities and it's We've always been behind always been behind yeah. but now this time's different because all the coasts are moving in inward and everyone from Texas is moving around and California California yeah. they all just you know the people that get pushed out of those cities come here because we have mountains and hiking and river and we have all the outdoor activities and and land is and was cheap <laughs> it's starting to <laughs> alex if if it wasn't for the crime albuquerque would be the probably one of the best places to ever live man that's you hit the nail on the head i mean you know there's just the, it's the the baggage in albuquerque just makes it um not for the faint of heart oh yeah we have a, a friend, an artist who moved from uh, Louisiana, and he he was see where he was. Um, yeah, I'm blanking where he where he lived and worked for a while, but he was like, "No, nah, I'm used to I'm used to like you know rough neighborhoods and you know having my shop and just." And so he ended up buying a house uh, and a studio here, and he's kind of near the war zone oh, and. Yeah. My dad is like, you know, avoid this part of town, avoid this part of town. You probably want to go here. And yeah. he's like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> and hey, God bless him. The first he's, year, though, he's like, man, Albuquerque's <laughs> something else. Yeah, it's it's legit. It, this the the crime and the the, the criminals here are, um, yeah, they're they're real. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, you know, it's, I don't know, I don't know how that changes um, other than just time, you know. Yeah, we can we can only hope because, like I said, if it if it wasn't for the crime, I mean, our weather is amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, I to this day I still don't own a winter coat. Really? Yeah. I mean, you know, winter here from what I'm used to, what I grew yeah, up in true. in Illinois, yeah. and it it's nothing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing, but I mean. It is where we're at right now, so. Yeah, I think, you know, fingers crossed over the next couple of years, it's just just with all the change and yeah. just, just a bunch of people moving in and um, people moving in, people moving out, money's changing just in the um, country as a whole. I mean, everything's just shifting in the way oh, yeah. we work. And um, I think, I mean, you're in a good spot because you've, it seems like people are really moving back towards that local they want to keep the money in their community yeah, or in their city. Sure. And, um, you know, you're probably in a good spot cause you, you're positioned yourself pretty, you know, solidly right now and you can really only grow from here. Yeah. And, and I mean, if there's anything positive that came from COVID, um, is exactly what you said. People are realizing supporting local, um, look at all the businesses that people have started, mm-hmm. you know, during COVID. Um, so we can only hope that that, that will produce a lot of positivity uh, mm-hmm. throughout the country. Yeah. Um, talk the line between craft and creativity. 
especially when there's clients or when you get orders. Um, I find, you know, like I mentioned earlier, it's hard for me to rein in, you know, my, my thoughts and my creativity. Absolutely. Sometimes I get like a project and I'm like, Oh, let's, you suggest things to clients and Hey, let's try this and this and this. And then you realize, ah, well, you know, they're paying for it. So I got to, <laughs> um, but with furniture, you know, cause furniture is kind of unique in that it's sort of like architecture where the main functions and size has to be very specific. Yeah, it's got to be spot on. You got some leeway in sort of how you connect things or how you, how you design the connections and right. how you, the scale and the proportion and the material choice. Um, so how do you walk the line between, designing something and then building it so um i've so in the beginning you know i was i was the guy that if you said you wanted it this way hey okay i want to get it done exactly the way they want it mainly because you're you're trying to uh, get that positive feedback from that customer saying this is exactly what i wanted they did it this way um, and you're trying to drum up the business, right? Mm -hmm. So um, as I went along, um, my my tattoo artist, actually, uh, Manuel Vega with Custom Tattoo, when I would go in to get a tattoo from Manny, <laughs> I would show him, okay, Manny, this is what I'd like. And he would look at me and say, yeah, we're not going to do that, <laughs> right? Or, hey, we can do that. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna tweak it a little mm. bit. And in the beginning, I'm kind of thinking, well, this is what I want, right? I'm the customer. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I had known Manny for years, so um, it was a little bit easier for me to be like, dude, what the hell are you talking about? This is what I want. <laughs> right. And Manny would say, hey, just trust me. And every time, it was spot on. Mm. Um, I liked it even better than my original design. So so with that, um, I kind of started adopting a little bit of that just as far as um, suggestions, right? So yes, uh, you know, I'd like this, I'd like this board, um, whatever design. And then I would suggest, okay, well, how about this? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and then there's some people that'll just call me and say, hey, surprise me, which is always cool, because then I can really just kind of let loose, you know? Yeah. Um, and now with the furniture, um, I'm actually currently working on a, a big bench uh, for the lobby uh, for Fit Scrubs. Hmm. Um, they've got a brick and mortar now um, up in Rio Rancho. Arthur Lucero uh, is the owner, so Arthur says, "Hey, I, you know, this is what I'd like." It, it was kind of a basic design. Um, I threw some things together, and uh, hopefully, it'll be done by the end of next week. It's, it's what he wants, mm -hmm. but it's got a little spin to it, and it, I, it, it looks sharp. So. Nice. Yeah, I did see that. Oh, yeah, yeah. In your shop. There. And yeah, it's coming along nicely. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what's your response usually when you get a customer that, hey, I want this, and you're right away you're like, that's ah, not going to work. It's, you know, I don't think you understand exactly what you're asking for because my dad gets it all the time with uh, – furniture requests and they say hey i want i want a cantilever this tabletop and make it a cool desk and it's always like well you know that's going to tip over or that's right. going to snap or it's going to be too heavy or yeah i'm sure you get requests all the time and you kind of have to almost give people a mini design uh lesson or just uh pure cost versus materials versus weight versus practicality and especially now with materials prices being oh, they're, they're unknown got, yeah they're through the roof it's you know you kind of as a as an artist you kind of have to dodge and weave and <laughs> it's yeah um you know and i know this may sound kind of harsh but there's times when i've just had to tell somebody flat out i can't do that right because and again, this goes back to Manny. Um, his name is on his work, right? Um, I, I, I kind of feel the same way. Yeah. So if I'm producing something that is going to eventually somebody's going to say, hey, you know, I, I fell off this damn <laughs> chair that you designed. Um, so, yeah, and 
and then of course you try to be tactful at times too right try to walk them through it like you said just say you know okay well we can do this but why don't we why don't we do it this way um and let me explain to you why Mm -hmm. and usually you know the the feedback is good it's like oh okay well that makes sense so yeah and that's uh that's something a very important important point is reputation especially now that we've mentioned like this whole kind of shift back towards local localism supporting local businesses it's like it's easy for the customer to really take that for granted like there's always going to be a new you know if that taco shop goes out of business there's just going to be another one that's, right but as the proprietor your reputation is like that that's your income that's your livelihood and absolutely yeah so you're absolutely right that it's sometimes you have to you have to be selective and know that it's you know you got to do a good job and everything because um yeah you're taking on all the risk and yeah <clears throat> excuse me and um you know alex I, I think i've been fortunate because when i started it i have a full-time job yeah So it was a little bit easier for me to pick and choose. Um, I was still thirsty, right? I'm I'm hungry. I I I want to drum up the business. I I want to, uh, you know, I want to get the name out there. But being able to be selective was probably uh, has probably been uh, a lifesaver for me. Yeah, that's uh, that mindset is a good spot to be like you said it's working full-time it's always easier to to turn a a hobby into a side project because the financial pressure isn't front of mind i personally i mean the way i when i mentioned i started my my business too soon it was heavily influenced by i i was bartending you know part-time in college and it's like oh man i would love to just do this and that was sort of where I was maybe misbegotten initially that, oh, I can just jump in and that'll be my other part time to fill in the income. And right. Inevitably, it just leads you to make bad choices when the pressure is on for making money. And yeah, it's uh, I'm glad that, you know, you brought that up and you knew that, that that's that makes a world of difference. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, there's times too, um, even like so like for me in the beginning also i had uh i had an issue with rushing Mm. things right because i wanted to turn out this this cool product uh product and to be able to tell somebody hey i can have it done in two to three days and i still do that oh yeah (laughs) i do that i I catch myself every week i'm like i should have added you know, always at thirty percent. That's been my. Absolutely. Yeah. I always sell myself short, or it's the time commitment. I'm like, nope. I just I have to make a rule. That's, yes. You know, push out both sides of it because otherwise you're, you know, yeah. Yeah, you you know you run yourself ragged, and and again, you know, it would be one thing if I was in in my shop, uh, trying to meet that deadline, every day, as opposed to going to a full time job. And during my downtime, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, if I get home by 4.30, um, you know, I could spend some time with the family, and then by 6.30, I need to be out in the shop. And so, um, yeah, that, I'm trying to do better. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, I think, I, I suspect that's gonna be a, a lifetime <laughs> balancing act. Yeah. Um, yeah, and now that you mention it, I mean, having a family, uh, is no joke either. I think that gets taken for granted a lot. Um, that's, uh, you know, that is a full-time job and so absolutely. You, I'm always impressed and I admire people that take on, I mean, you've got basically three full-time jobs. Um, and you know, and you're still have your head on your shoulders and you know, you're not always, <laughs> <laughs> but at least in, you know, for the, if for the most part, for the yeah. most part, you know, it's like people that can do that and keep it together is important yeah it's um you know i think i've been fortunate with um you know when i met my wife i was already a a detective and so she came into it knowing my schedule my crazy schedule back then especially um and then you know once we had our kiddo um she and i don't know if this is good or bad but she grew up 
in that schedule and she um she was always understanding you know a really level-headed child uh, was probably saving that that saved me from having that stress of you know being that absent dad um and uh, i think that was another reason why a lot of the time once i got home from work that was it like i, I was home mm -hmm. you know to to make sure i was there um and then it didn't hurt that uh my daughter loves she really enjoys um being out in the shop yeah, that's she's cool. she, yeah she's got a creative mind um she's mechanical like me uh, smarter than me but <laughs> but uh yeah she'll come out there and you know she's she's built some things um and there's times when i'm out there and she'll ask hey dad is there anything i can help you with um so that that makes it a lot easier for me for sure yeah that's great and you know it's funny that's i didn't really know that ahead of time like before we ever met but like i realized oh we have a lot of similarities and then like yeah i've kind of i've always been a part of my parents business like back when they had the retail store right. and my dad was traveling basically uh i think he said he got up to like 175 days a year just doing art shows on the road on the road you know it's like three days out three day show three days back yeah uh, he would drive as far as seattle baltimore <laughs> chicago um that's impressive and you know I, I would do that in the summers yeah um ever since i was a baby you know they would throw me in the crib in the back of the booth and and yeah so it's all i've always been in that schedule not as uh not rigid like you know in law enforcement it's not right. like the set but it was always something it was always every two weeks or what have you um and yeah just growing up an only child and that you're like this is oh this is the way the world works yeah but it's clearly not <laughs> all the time it's it's so different you know yeah um but yeah, just being a part of it's it's nice when your family sort of works to their uh, in a cohesive fashion. Yeah, it, I mean, it's it's a game changer because I, you know, I, I think about it sometimes, Alex, and I'm thinking if it wasn't for the ability to, you know, start this business um, along with my full time job, uh, the the crazy schedule of that. I probably would have never done it. Um, it would have just made things, you know, too too difficult. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm thankful for that. Yeah. Well, great. Um, what are you looking forward to these days? Retirement. What, retirement. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, easy question. That's, yeah. that's right on the horizon. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you're probably just home stretch. It's. It is. Uh, it, it's it's a really good feeling. Um, you know, I've I paid my dues, and uh, time to pass the torch to the, to the to the young guys to come in and do it. Hey, that's it. It's uh, you know, I think that's a good good spot to end uh, today's podcast. Is you know, there's always you always got to put your time in and be humble and yeah. Um, you know, got to say thanks for doing that kind of work for so long and absolutely and coming out the other end and ready to start something new. Yeah. The, and you know, I think another little quick piece to that is, uh, the support from law enforcement, right. Um, with, from following on, on Facebook and Instagram, uh, to, you know, the purchasing products and stuff. It, it's been, it's been great. And, and I really appreciate all, all the uh, brothers and sisters in uh, blue out there. So it's, yeah, it's awesome. Glad, glad to it. hear. Glad to hear. Um, yeah. Any, any parting words, uh, words of advice, any, no, I, I wish I had something really wise to say right now, other than man, you know, just do what makes you happy. Yeah. That's for me that that's been the, the end all be all. You know, from law enforcement to um, to the woodworking, it brings me joy, relaxation, and so if if people can find that, you're you're ahead of the game. Awesome, Eric. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, Alex. I appreciate the podcast. it. We'll, we'll do it again for sure. Yeah, it's we'll, uh, awesome. 
we'll we'll keep it going and we'll i'm sure we're going to have more projects to collaborate on and Definitely. um all the links and all the websites we're going to put up in the notes and in the everything else um but your website uh people can probably follow or find through instagram or right yes on uh, black hammer designs on instagram and there's the the link in the in the bio perfect yeah that'll all be up and um yeah we'll uh i look forward to working with you more and absolutely thanks for doing this appreciate it thanks all right peace out